on this piece of paper come up here. Right now. Um, if your name is not on this piece of paper and you want to be on this line, come on up. The way it works is it doesn't matter that Ryan Noble is first. If someone on this list is um, a shorter amount of time, they go first. So everyone come on down and then we'll bubble sort you into the right order. Oh, and also you can line jump if your talk doesn't require a computer. If you don't need slides hooked up because you don't need setup time, you can jump to the front line. Okay. So are you all sorted there? Slides just be able to, oh, okay. Well, my name is Jack, and I'm the best um, reason for you to believe that you should be doing a lightning talk because I'm going to talk about something I don't quite understand. So, here's a pattern, it's really useful, it's uh, underutilized, but it's forking your Ruby process into another operating system process. Uh, some benefits Unicorn does this, it loads your app once, it forks it off into workers, and that's instant each time it's going to load it again. A worker dies, it just kills that process forks itself again. Uh, it's a great way to get uh, memory rollbacks instantly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? Am I getting that? Uh, oh, damn Right, so again, you'll do better than me if you do a lighting talk tomorrow, so please sign up. Okay, so here's a common situation. You have a uh, Something you need to do. Runner is a thing I want to evaluate. It could be huge, in this case, I'm adding. In memory, I call it, and it gets assigned to a value, and now I have a result. Lovely, but in, that's just one process. Let's say I want to fork. I have my runner. I fork the process. This all happens in a set process, or a different a child process. Yeah, I set result to whatever runner happens to evaluate to, and I leave. But result is nil, because I didn't store that. The, Remember, split in half, two dimensions, imagine a git branch from earlier, like they can't talk to each other. So, the way this is usually handled is some kind of I.O. So, you can do a, a Unix socket. I'm like, you can rally that again. <laughs> All right, I'm just really popular. Uh, a Unix socket, um, a TCP socket, you can do a web call, um, communicate with the database. Somehow, outside of this memory process, you need to have your child and parent talk to each other. Um, I'll leave that to an exercise to your implementation. But imagine you have this thing called send2, which outputs something to this interface, and wait and get from, which wait blocks and waits for something from. In this fork, you can send to the parent IO the result of runner.call, and then wait until it um, gets something back from that parent, and then leave. And then in your parent process, which will be having this as parent process, and happens at the same time as child process, uh, you can first wait for this line and then send this to this line and now you have an actual result. Um, if you want to see this in uh, implementation working three completely different ways, the unicorn, the forker, and the spork gem all do this in different ways. Um, it's really useful if you're writing a test framework or something and you want to have a context that is a setup block that's run once and a bunch of suites that are run um, independently and you want instant memory rollback so it doesn't happen to like do any magic for the processes. I don't know, find a uh, use for this and uh, hopefully it'll speed up your code. Thanks. Good afternoon. Frank, I'd like to talk about XML. This is the Java conference, right? <laughs> okay, 
I guess not. Oh, uh, sorry. How do you actually deal with XML? Most of you, you don't, know, right? Like when we write new applications, I'm happy to see in Rails 3.1 it says to JSON now. I don't have to replace all that XML stuff. But uh, when I was asking around, like, how do people deal with XML, I found a bunch of different answers on, on more when I just sorted through conversation. And I can't quite get really, like, a good, solid answer what people like to use. And uh, when I started at the company that I was working at now, they used Crack. And I got the company off Crack. <laughs> uh, and I kind of look at XML in a lot of ways data, in a lot of ways, like, exposure to radiation. Like, in small amounts, this is all right. XML is not bad for you. Right? It's a little, it's like radiation, because when you deal with something like this, and this is what I deal with, like multiple different objects, I mean, I know you're going to say there's just namespaces up there and it's just taking up space, but all those namespaces are used, and this goes on for several thousand lines, I know this, I live this. This is stress, people. So I found this uh, gem called Happy Mapper, and I was really excited about it, but everyone at work said, hey, you've got to use Nokiguri Happy Mapper. I was using the website Ruby Toolbox to find these cute little statistics. Uh, so someone said, hey look, I don't like your happy mapper, so I'm going to make it the Nokopuri happy mapper. So yay, look, I found it. That's me, I was putting some commits there about updating their examples, because I thought they were really bad. So let's talk about happy mapper a little bit, and how it's used to actually deal with XML in a really nice way, in an almost sort of active record sort of way. Uh, it's as easy as one, two, three. If you notice the XML at the top, and then you see the class that maps to the XML. So number one, you include happy member. <coughs> number two, um, and I likely didn't even need to do this, but there's a tag call that matches to the tag of the XML. And number three, I define all the elements below. That seems pretty good, right? Let me do it again. <laughs> one, two, three. All right, but I know what you're saying. Four, how do I handle that guy? Public school, public school. Okay, so four. Actually, what I did was made a little subclass in the middle there. I just did the same thing again. I have a little country class, happy mapper. It's got a tag country, and I use attribute and text node, so you can deal with attributes and text nodes. And here we go. I've got an element that says country. Isn't that exciting? Woo! All right, so I got it. What about for this douchebag? Excuse me. I mean, the guy that came before me. He built some element that had some crazy name. Well, oops. It's easy to deal with, because all you need to do is specify a tag. So that's really nice, right? Cool. What about where streets have two names? In this case, you can say, I has many now. See that has many? It even highlights if you're doing the Rails thing, it shows it to you, that way it affects me. <laughs> See? <laughs> totally. <laughs> All right. Parsing. Parsing is super simple. I made the class. Happy Mapper puts this little parse method on there, and that's it. Returns all those values for me. Isn't that awesome? Let's look at the big kids meal. Dealing with namespaces and also some other sort of fancy things, XPath in there. So here we go, namespaces. You put a namespace up there, and it sort of defaults to all those. But you can override a namespace. <coughs> By default, it's going to grab everything underneath the sun that's there, like we have in our thing. Well, you can actually specify an XPath to make sure it only happens for this gallery instead of all galleries. See that? Great. So what about some other things, like dealing with like stuff I had to deal with, which was this situation right here. I had these multiple classes inside of there, so I had to deal with composition was a model, a module, module way of dealing with the composition here. So a lot of these had very similar functionality, yet they had all different namespaces. It was very frustrating. So I thought, ah, I'll do this, but it doesn't work, because Happy Mapper assigns it to the class. So I figured out, hey, let's program like a Ruby programmer. And I decided to use some actual fun Ruby better programming and did the included method there. And the object it pulls in, I define those things that are shared between all of them. It's really easy to do to have like sharing this like publication information across the, the whole way. But what about 2XML? You've got it from XML, what about pulling it to XML? Particularly the gross stuff with all the namespaces. Well, they didn't have it, so I wrote something on it. I'm sort of adopted the project <laughs> and put the unhappy mapper part to it. You can kind of check out this information about it. So. Uh, thank you very much.
Yeah. Uh, anyhow, I, um, uh, I was one of the organizers of Great Lakes Ruby Bash last year, um, and uh, we were thinking about something cool to do for um, the attendees, uh, and I happened to be friends with some guy who roast coffee. Um, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so this is like Michigan coffee. Um, and uh, so he made, he designed these bags and stuff for our conference. We gave them out to people at the conference. And so now whenever I go to a conference, I lug around a bunch of coffee to hand out to people um, in exchange for them telling me a story of some kind. So I have a bunch of coffee in my bag, and if you come up to me and tell me a story, I'll give you a bag of coffee. Um, but I'm going to tell you a story real quick, which is how uh, coffee gets made, like, before you make it. Um, so, coffee comes in big bags like this from some guy in uh, Central America or Africa or something. Um, hopefully the people who pick the coffee were not horribly abused. That's not always the case. Um, I don't know if you can tell very well from there, but the, the beans are kind of green when they show up. Um, and they actually have a lot more caffeine like this than they do by the time they're roasted. Um, but then you dump a bunch of coffee beans into something that looks like that, which is essentially a big um, metal drum that gets very, very hot. Um, they're in there for oh, 15 minutes or so until they're about 470 some odd degrees. Uh, and then that's my friend John, and uh, they come out, cool down, and they end up in a bag. Um, and these are some of the sketches, and this is the little logo thing we came up with. That's um, Billy slash Ruby Brew's information about the coffee. Um, and come find me, and I will give you coffee. <laughs> Two more minutes, so I'm just going to stand here. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Um, I don't have any slides. Uh, I was just going to talk to you guys really quick about my experience uh, getting pulled into the open source community, and especially uh, getting pulled into Ruby, and present you with basically four concrete steps for if you've got anybody else, any friends, or um, family members, dogs, whoever, that you want to teach Ruby and that you want to get involved into the open source community, um, sort of how you can help them to do that, um, help them avoid some of the snags. So step one, uh, show them Ruby is awesome. Step two, do something with them. Step three, show them the community, get them hooked up with the, uh, with the community. And step four, teach them Git. Um, so step one, Show them Ruby is awesome. There's lots of different ways to do this. You can show them a project that you did. You can, um, if they're a programmer, you can hook them up with, I love Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby. Um, if you haven't read it, it's pretty awesome. Um, but whichever aspect of the language is gonna get them excited, show that to them. Step two though is to do something with them because if you just toss it out there and then you're like, hey, look at this, then they're gonna get around to it when they get around to it. But if you actually do something with them, then they'll be like, oh, this is fun. Um, if you hook them up with the community, that attitude of this is fun, I like to do this, is going to be self-sustaining because they're going to get to know other people in the community, they're going to get to contribute to stuff. Um, it's going to start to maintain momentum. Um, and step four, teaching them Git, because frustration is the thing that shuts down people trying to learn some new skills the fastest. And basically, if they delete a couple hours worth of code, they're going to throw your language out the window and never look back. So, um, that's it. Thank you. Everybody, uh, go to makorb.com. 
So what is Mango? Uh, who here in the audience, uh, by a show of hands, have heard of Jekyll, the web framework? Cool. And uh, Sinatra? So think of Mango as Jekyll on Sinatra. It's a website framework. It's dynamic. It's database free. It's built for small teams and of developers, designers, and writers. It's open source. And it uses Ruby 1.9. So why did I build Mango? Uh, well, like I said, I'm a web developer by trade. And I love the, the Ruby universe. But it's really painful when I have to leave that universe. And I have to leave that universe to collaborate with other uh, developers, designers, or writers. So my goal with Mango is to make it easy for others to collaborate with me using the language and tools that I love. Um, it does this using uh, activity-based collaboration, write, theme, publish, extend, and maintain. These are the five uh, areas uh, that Mango tries to solve. So how does Mango make it easy to write? Well, for me, uh, the environment, my writing environment, is the biggest thing. This next slide works for me. This is a slide of TextMate. You can substitute this for Eclipse or Vim or Emacs. This next slide doesn't work for me. This is WordPress's admin interface. So Mango takes the approach of using files uh, instead of using database records to store your content. Content formats include Markdown, HAML, ERB, and Liquid. Here's an example of a content page. At the top, this is uh, like Jekyll, has a YAML front matter where you can define your metadata. Down below is the body. Notice that your page title is included from your metadata. <coughs> Mango is also really easy to theme. Uh, you can get started very simply by using static uh, template files, like HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. But if you want to use dynamic template files, it also supports HAML, ERB, and Liquid for those, as well as CSS, SCSS and SAS, and CoffeeScript too. <coughs> so here's an example of a template file. Notice we're using the same page title from the content. And also this is where we're pulling in the body from the content file. Mango is also really easy to publish because it's built on Sinatra. Uh, and Sinatra uses Rack. So I like to deploy to Heroku, and it's as easy as git push production master. But for non-programmers, like some of my friends who are designers, what to do for them? Well, I tend to recommend uh, them to use Git because of version control just basically means that your content files have history. And this is kind of the environment that they get to work in. This is an uh, example of Git Tower, which I think somebody was talking about earlier uh, today. Um, also, Mango supports drag and drop SFTP publishing, which is something I really miss from my days of working at PHP. Uh, Mango is also really easy to extend. So the, one of the big things, uh, one of the reasons why I wrote Mango is because Jekyll didn't, uh, doesn't support server-side processing, it just generates a static file. So there are some things that are really important for me on my projects, uh, like HTTP responses and PHP. So I, that includes things like redirects, uh, browser caching, minifying my JavaScript and CSS, uh, and also support for um, the JavaScript frameworks like Backbone.js. Uh, also, uh, server-side processing is important when I want to communicate with customers. Uh, through email and newsletters, uh, and uh, device location awareness, like if I want to send specific content to mobile devices, or do geolocation and do language translations. Um, and lastly, uh, Mango is really easy to maintain because you install it as a Ruby gem and it respects, uh, and, and you upgrade using Bundler and it respects a uh, semantic version. So, Mango means collaboration. Thank you.
problem that I've been dealing with lately has been how do I get various websites to really behave together um, and to play well with others. This is a problem I'm dealing with in our company and a lot of other people are dealing with this. So before I answer that question, I just want to go back to the history a little bit. You know, Web 1.0, which was really about the portal, there was personalization and we had, you know, things like web scraping, we had offline data sources, we had lots of hyperlinks, and basically every portal behaved like a castle. You had information, you went to the portal, you got to see it, you didn't really get to do much with it, but just to view it and access it. Web 2.0 made it a little bit better, I could take data from various sources, put it all together, make a useful tool that I could, you know, look at all the information presented on a map. Um, you know, we had things like JSON and XML coming into play. We have simple services to do things like, hey, I want to pay for something, I want to display something on a map, and you also have things like live syndication. Um, so if I want to have some feeds show up somewhere else, that's pretty easy to do. So we have lots of content mashups. Pretty good, but again, the data's not really working together. So let's look at what I see Web 3.0 is evolving to be. And you know, I asked on the web, I did a search to see what people were thinking Web 3.0 would be, and lots of different answers, a lot of them kind of vague. My favorite answer was uh, Conrad Wolfram's answer, which was, you know, he sees it where we're really, you know, the computer's generating information rather than humans. And what I see that as meaning is, is that, you know, the data is working together with you. So, you know, we have a few tools out there like, you know, RDF, you know, semantic formats, OWL, got, you know, we need to have some sort of a multi-directional data flow. Data is coming to me, but it also is going back out. Um, we want to have some form of synchronization. That's particularly important. And uh, we really want to build federations of shared services, where it's not just one tool doing everything or exporting the information. You really want them to work together. So, you know, we got a whole bunch of tools that are available out there now, you know, like OpenID and OAuth, and, you know, you know you've got things like being able to show things off of Twitter, and you've got Facebook apps, and you've got RESTful APIs, which can allow them to really work together. But what's really missing from the equation is having semantic transactions. You really want to be able to um, have data that I'm creating on one site that I can have send over to another site, and I can update it on there, and it comes back. And this is a particular problem when it comes to the help desk. This is a very typical display of what's out there in terms of how companies manage customer support. There are all these different systems that have to work together to you know, just deal with a particular issue of solving customer support problems. So how we can resolve this, there's this new um, consortium called the Networked Help Desk. I wanted to point you out to it. This is like one of, se of several new initiatives that are actually working to create shared cooperative um, you know, websites where you can actually, uh, there's an API on this website, I uh, welcome you to go at it. There's a whole bunch of uh, folks, some of them are actually competitors, but they're all agreeing to work together to create a shared standard for how I can take data and have it available on other sites and have them be able to send updates and have them propagate. So, you know, look at the, some of those logos at the bottom. And, uh, and this is an open standard. Um, you can go to networkhelpdesk.org, take a look at the API, um, see what you think, and I just encourage everyone to think about how can we work together to create um, shared, semantic, common APIs that we can use together, and therefore we can have all of our sites just sort of play nicely with each other. So, that's about it. Thanks. <laughs> screencast in the user and all it does is decide whether the user can download a given screencast. 
And I'm going to show you what TDD looks like when I do it. So I'm going to add a spec called uh, it is not allowed for anonymous users. I'm using device, so an anonymous user is just nil, sadly. And I'm going to invoke my uh, module, ask it whether the download is allowed for this screencast with an anonymous user, and that should be false. There's my failure, run over here, add a line of code. That was Python, sorry. Uh, <laughs> still happens occasionally. And there, I'm green. Now, the reason that I've showed you this is that the length of that cycle where I was running the code was so short. And this is, uh, I think, very important. And in the Ruby world, spec running often looks more like this. <laughs> That's bad. That's, that is not good. Uh, this is much better. So that's my lib directory, which contains, uh, sadly, still less than half my specs, although they're moving over there slowly as I extract behavior from models and controllers and helpers and move it into naked objects. But you can see that instead of six seconds, I took 600 some milliseconds. So it's roughly a tenth of the time. And that one spec that I showed you, the download policy, has an end-to-end -end runtime prompt to 160 milliseconds. So that's something like 30, 40 times faster. And that allows me to hit my red-green cycle in full about once per minute, or uh, often even less than that. So what I do in order to achieve that, I lied by the way, there are slides, is <laughs> I, I take all these things that I might interact with, models, various rail stuff, routes, helpers, and I need to eliminate all the crap that these things pull in that slows me down. So basically everything is going to depend on core Rails stuff that I neither understand nor want to understand. And Rails itself has about a 3.6 second, 3 second load time for me on my box on 187. If you're on 19, that penalty doubles roughly. So you're paying about 7 to 8 millisecond, uh, 7 to 8 second load time every time you load Rails. So basically what I do is stub everything all the time. And uh, there's a word for this, it's called London-style TDD, or isolationist TDD, or mockist TDD. But uh, it is a style in which you only interact with fake things. You never integrate directly with another class in the system, whether you wrote it or not. Uh, and this, first of all, makes your specs extremely fast. I average about one to two milliseconds per spec. Uh, and it makes your end-to-end -end times fast, because you don't have to load dependencies. And of course, whenever I speak about this in public, uh, as is my nature, I state the most extreme form. So I don't literally isolate from everything all the time. But I think it would be a good idea for more Rubyists to start thinking harder about isolating from dependencies. Because you want these two benefits. You want the faster cycle times, and you want the design benefits of seeing things like, uh, in my spec, what am I integrating with? Well, I had to stub it all. So here's my full, the full set of things I could possibly integrate within this spec. Because if you look at the requires, the only thing I require is download policy. And download policy is this module that requires nothing. So there's nothing else in the code path. I know that this is my full set of integrations. And that's very valuable, very valuable for design. So that's all I have. Uh, and I would love to hear you guys come up to me afterwards and tell me why I'm an idiot, because that happens a lot with this topic. Thanks. <laughs> So, that's me. I go by Vegan Straight Edge on the internet. I live like that. I used to live here in Seattle uh, a few years ago. I now live in L.A. No. Sure. Um, you know, there's not been enough heckling today. Which I'm especially disappointed in Ryan Davis. He's usually our chief heckler. 
There you go. Uh, so I work for a company called Engineer, and they're one of our sponsors, Disclosure or whatever. And this job is unlike any job I've had my whole career or whatever. Most of my career I've made websites, usually for other people. And it's, you know, the technology I've used has changed over the years. And um, a few months ago, I started at Engine Yard. Uh, I still, you know, make a website here and there, but uh, mostly what I do is talk to people and get them excited about stuff. And my title there is Open Source Cheerleader. And Dr. Nick is my boss, and if any of you know Dr. Nick, it, it's pretty requisite that there will be costumes at some, some point. Um, so, uh, I have primarily worked on promoting or evangelizing or whatever, Rubinius, and I'm you know, expanding my gaze to include JRuby. Um, and I want to share some of the things I've learned in a short time, so I don't have all the answers. I don't really I don't have some definitive thing here, but I've been there about three months, and it's a, a fairly new role in our industry in general. Um, so it's not real clear what to call this thing. Um, like people say, oh, what do you do? I say, that's a great question. So here's some things I've learned. People love free shit. Um, we made Rubinia stickers, I mean, t-shirts, and um, we give them away. You just have to email us. You don't have to do anything special. And we made a whole bunch and gave them away at RailsConf in Baltimore, and then we made more and then we just mailed them out of my house. People love it. Um, that's for a special shirt. I'm getting there, Captain. Uh, we also made stickers that require zero effort except for emailing us. Um, although uh, we have other stickers that are like merit badges that you do have to do stuff. And uh, people love that. It's such a small thing. I have some on my computer. Um, and we, we expected that people who are into Rubinius would ask for these things. But what's happened is the opposite. It's people who don't know about Rubinius see these things and then get interested and then later excited and participate in Rubinius. Uh, we've tried to turn up the like, engagement and the conversation with the community or whatever. So the, the first thing I did, which was super simple, is I just followed all of our followers back. Everyone got excited about that, that it like, turned up the dialogue up a lot, and also enabled everyone to direct message us. So if they need to send us something private or whatever, they can. You know, sometimes maybe it's a private gist of like, you know, their stack trace, they don't want to expose their class name or something. Um, and also, people can just email us about anything outside of, you know, bugs and issues or whatever. But this is also where people write us to ask for free shit, and we send it to them, and they get excited about that. Um, we've also coordinated a handful of events. So at RailsConf, Dr. Nick said, if you use uh, Rubinius during these three days, we'll give you a sticker. And then, you know, we had like 50 people try out Rubinius that had never played with it for a sticker, right? I mean, I, I, that's awesome. It's, that's such a uh, cost-effective investment. <laughs> it's great. And, and it's, it's such a small thing to get people excited in the, in, in the door. Uh, coming up on August 5th is RBX Day where people all over the world who are into Rubinius are going to run their apps on Rubinius and send us a performance report and you know, submit bugs and stuff. And we've always been asking for this stuff, but by making it an event, a day, you know, making it like a party where we're telling people to take pictures and wear your party pants and your party hats, like people are getting excited about it. This place in Mountain View is hosting like 80 people coming to their office to test their apps. And we're trying to be more open about what we're doing. <coughs> So we made this status board, which is very fuzzy, of our progress on these different features for 1.9 support in Rubinius. And people got really excited about that. They were like, oh, I could tell that Windows support is pretty far along, but symbol is not for it. Um, and, you know, like, just little things. Like, I, I posted a picture of Brian and Evan working on how they were going to deal with, I don't remember what. Um, um, Method in mind, maybe? But you know, like people get excited, They're like, oh, this is how the, the mad scientists work. And we also open sourced all of our collateral, so all of our logos and that stuff. So people in South America have made t shirts rather than ordering one from us and dealing with shipping. And um, our project, you know, we're a bunch of, you know, just goofy 
dudes. So all of our sort of communication tends to have that kind of voice too. And it's turned some people off a little bit, um, but overwhelmingly people have been really excited about it. So like this post was when I announced the status board, but it's written in this fictional dialogue between Evan's grandma and Evan, and Evan's grandma asking for some sort of progress report on Rubinius. And it's silly, but like that's the kind of people we are, and like the project reflects that. And you know, we also take pictures like this, and that's not totally staged, you know, Evan just gives me nuggies. And when I send out stickers to people, at least in the beginning before I got too overwhelmed, I'd write a little like handwritten notes and I signed all of our correspondence, XOXO, RBX. And like people have reciprocated. You know, people tell us that they love Rubinias, you know, so it's um, like that that's the voice of us and the voice of like our project and it's gone a long way to help like participation. And like I said, I've only been doing this for a few months, so I don't know how successful it's going to be. Um, but that's what 600 t-shirts look like. And we, we got rid of those at RailsConf in like three hours. And then I've got another 600 at my house, or part of 600 that haven't been shipped. So if you want Rubinius t-shirts, just email community at rubini.us. And that's the map of all the places that we've shipped shirts and stickers. So there's at least, you know, people in most corners of the world who have got excited about Rubinius since this to sort of like open engagement or that's it. I love you. I spontaneously came up with this talk. This is the talk that I was going to do if I didn't do the other talk that I'm going to do in about 30 minutes. So, now you get both. This one will just be abbreviated. Um, all right, so I am with Living Social today, and what I want to talk about is some of the applications we build are for the consumers, especially on the mobile side, and some of the applications we build are for merchants. Right, because so what we're doing is we're connecting consumers with merchants and things like that. And um, we don't currently have apps in the App Store for merchants. We have apps in the uh, App Store for consumers for the Living Social app. Um, so we were challenged to kind of come up with this, and uh, I run the.